Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, Episode 37, Funky Languages. Take it away, Jason. Hey, everybody. So, uh, yeah, we got an interesting question from... Uh, Many interesting questions. Yeah, we got several interest. Yeah, definitely. Several interesting questions. Um, I try to answer them on, uh, you know, Google Plus slash Facebook slash Twitter, wherever they come slash email. But uh, this one was particularly interesting. So, uh, yeah, we wanted to discuss it on the show. Um, so Will wrote in and said, uh, basically, um, what do you guys think about moving to Silicon Valley? Um, you know, I live on the East Coast. Uh, he lives in a small town in Georgia. Um, I'm assuming he's doing tech, uh, developing mobile applications, and uh, he just wants to know, should I, uh, you know, make the trip over to Silicon Valley? So, I don't know. What do you think? I'll, 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 uh, I'll let you have the first shot of this. There are many factors which should influence one's decision to relocate. Oh, God. The first, <laughs> uh, so, no, 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 but seriously, like... Um, if you've never visited and you haven't like, if you're just thinking like, should I interview? The answer is yes, you should probably interview. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. More generally, you should interview. Uh, part of that is you'll probably get a chance to come out here because we are in the Silicon Valley. So that's why I say here. Um, right. So you get a chance to come out and visit, see what it's like. Um, but I mean, everybody will tell you that property is really expensive. It's expensive to buy a place to live in or even just to rent a place, uh, at least in the really uh, kind of, main part of Silicon Valley. Um, but there is a reason why everybody wants to live here. That is that there's a lot of good places to work and, you know, the area is beautiful. The weather's great. Um, and people love paying taxes. <laughs> people love paying taxes. I think you make a really good point. If you interview, um, provided you make, pa- make it past the phone screen, um, you basically get a free trip to Silicon and Valley. That's for most big companies. Every company is a little different, but most big companies are that way. Even startups, actually, like uh, when I was looking around when I was still on the East Coast, um, uh, startups would also pay for you to for you to come. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah wow. At the time I was interviewing at Tesla and uh, at the time they were like a really small company and they they uh, they totally flew me over there or offered to fly me over there, ended up picking a different company. But uh, but yeah, so so, you know, you can interview, get a free trip, make sure you uh if possible, interview on, you know, like a Monday or a Friday so you can come the weekend or at least, that's true. you know, take some days off or something. Um, and be upfront with the recruiter, right? Because their job is to be very nice to you. Um, and I, I was, al- I'm always, I give this advice, but I know I was always very timid in asking for things or accommodation basically. But, you know, if you have a significant other, a spouse or something, don't take advantage of it in my opinion, but like, you know, if they're debating whether or not they would also like to move, you should say, hey, like as a as a couple, we're determining this. Like, is it possible for my wife to join me on this trip or whatever? Um, yeah, that's that's a really good point. I mean, I, I didn't do that and I kind of regretted it. I mean, it it worked out fine, but uh, it was a little nerve wracking for my wife to uh, like literally her first day in California was the day we moved. And it's like there's really no going back. And so, yeah, if I had to do it over again, I would have asked, you know, if you think about it, if you interview at like a big company, you know, uh, you know, two or three hundred dollar plane ticket. I mean, they, you know, they're not going to it's not going to set them back and it could yeah, really do. You and having another good. person isn't really that big a deal because like, you know, they don't have to pay for another hotel room or right. really anything. Um, so there I did ask it from one recruiter, um, not for the Bay Area, but um for another area and I did ask uh, and they said that I could. I didn't end up taking them up on it because I ended up taking another offer. Um, but I, they were very, you know, sure, of course, you know, like that's no problem. Uh, and I had actually already flown there and interviewed and I was asking to fly me and my wife together out again to do kind of like an exploration trip and they were okay with that as well. Yeah, right. So um, that totally makes sense. So getting back to the question. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I mean, so, so you're right that you should definitely interview and all that. So we didn't waste time or anything. But, okay. But, but, the, but should uh, you move? Should you move Silicon Valley? So um, here's my take on it. So it's a little bit of a different question, but it'll come back to the main point. 
Somebody asked me, how come we can't just recreate Silicon Valley, you know, in Florida or, or, or somewhere else, right? And there's been many attempts, like there's a place in India that's supposed to be like a technology triangle that's trying to be like an incubator. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of places all over the world that are like kind of tech incubators. Um, and a lot of them like get traction and of course they're successful to some degree, but like none of them are close to the success of Silicon Valley, right? And what I think about this is that you have sort of this pool of talent and, and a lot of the information you need to be a successful tech company is sort of latent. You know, it's, it's, it's lessons learned. It's not something you can really find in school, especially now because, you know, there's so much disconnect like people in silicon valley aren't going back to university and teaching or anything like that so there's just so many lessons to be learned and so much um sort of what's the word for it where it's like uh you just kind of have to you know be grandfathered into it there's not really a way to learn other than yeah it's like this this language that's evolved over time that basically you know to be a successful company you need a couple of say you know silicon valley veterans and so if there was some kind of migration out of the valley, then we could get these incubators in other places. But at the moment, you know, the best place and one of the only places to get sort of veterans who have been doing, you know, big data or, or you know, practical machine learning or whatever um, is, is here. And those people aren't moving. So, um, so there because are other... But there okay. are other places, like I, I read stuff a lot um, about New York, right? It's not to the same degree of startups, but like New York City has a lot of tech jobs and, and tech yeah, that's industry. True. And it somewhat, I think, is partly just the, you need a certain density of people and then a certain percentage of those people to be, you know, technologically minded, advanced computer science people, like that kind of stuff. And the areas, like if you take, uh, you know, Jason and I are both from Florida. If you take the areas in Florida where we were, even if there may be a lot of people, the density is relatively low. And uh, the number of people who are from a technology background uh, is also very low. Right. And there's a chicken and an egg problem because um, let's say you're a brand new company. Uh, like you're some startup. You just have an idea. You know, you're Uber and you want to be, you know. A phone app where people can request bars that they show up, bartenders, and they show up. Um, you know, you're going to have like a little bit of funding to get started, and you need to get some very talented people, or at least one very talented person, to build, you know, version one of the system. That means you're going to have to find someone who's willing to quit their job and take a huge risk to join your company. And that means you have to go through a lot of people. Like, it might be a one in 10,000. Uh, chance that you find someone who's in that position and so if you go to say you know florida where there might only be nine thousand people who have that kind of skill set now you're really in trouble right and so because of that you know you don't have this sort of snowball effect and so silicon valley is like one of the few places where you can um where you can go and find some very senior people to work on something you know that's just an idea right yeah so, yeah. so I would say, should I move? It's obviously subject to a lot of personal decisions and it is expensive to live here. But mm -hmm. I mean, there are two things that are good. Is one is Jason kind of talked about like those talented people is also good for you as an employee because there's a lot of people to learn from uh, and a lot of really smart people typically. Um, right. Yeah, you know, there are not smart people too, I guess, but there are a lot of smart people. And if you can find them, you can learn a lot, not even at your own company, but just like everywhere, right? It's all around you. Um, yeah, definitely. The other thing is like, for me, it's much better to move on my terms. Like I decided like I wanted to move and moved out here. Um, and then now if something happened and I was forced into needing to get a different job or, you know, there was a downturn in my company, right, then I would be forced to uh, relocate. And if I'm here, the chance of me having to relocate away is uh, low compared to where I was before. Yeah, um, that's true. Now there's still the problem of like what happens, like what happened in 2000s with the tech burst, tech bubble burst. Um, but I'm already in the tech industry. So like in general, it's going to be a bad time for me regardless of where I am. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, yeah, I, actually it's kind of, it's quite interesting. When the tech bubble burst, I don't know if there was necessarily like a, like 
people out of a job. Actually, no, I take it back. Yeah, I, I read stories about people like... I think it got pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But uh, to be honest, I find it very unlikely. I do think that there is a little bit of a bubble now. But I think if it burst, there's such a lack of talent that uh, that the companies that are established will just swoop up all of the talent. Um, I don't feel like that well will run dry, you know. So basically, the long answer is uh, it's it's up to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we uh, I th- I think I, it's fair to say for for both of, speak for both of us when I say that you know we love it here, but uh, but yeah, you should definitely uh, bring you know your significant other if you have one and uh, and and give it a good evaluation, um, you know, before you come. So yeah. So speaking of Silicon Valley and startups, how does a startup work? Yeah, so you know, I think you know we're we we've been. Uh, in Silicon Valley, you're completely inundated with startups, like reading about startups, friends who go to work for startups, things like that. But, um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day that you know, when I was in Florida, um, I really had no idea sort of what a startup is or anything. And, uh, you know, we're both tech savvy people, but it's just not a, it's really just a part of Silicon Valley culture. Um, and so I felt like I wanted to try to share that with everyone. So, uh, uh, you know, neither Patrick nor I have ever worked in a startup. Um, we both have friends who are who are at startups or have started startups. Um, and yeah, basically, so this is kind of how it works in a nutshell. And Patrick, please, please correct me because I'm okay. sure I'm going to mess stuff up. But um, you typically um, try to start by ta- contacting venture capitalists. So you make a very quick prototype. So some common uh, you know examples are the Zappos, um, that Zappos... Uh, you know, shoe sales website. The guy actually started by um, going to Payless, taking like a real, you know, brick and mortar, like a Payless shoe store, taking pictures of the shoes there, and then going on his computer and making an HTML page, selling those shoes for, I think it's like a 10 or 15% markup online. And then literally, if someone would buy the shoes, he would walk down the street to the Payless, buy the shoes, mail them himself right so it's like super super low tech um but uh it was enough to go to a venture capitalist and say look i've been doing this for a month and i got you know two thousand people ordering shoes um and then what will happen is another way to do it is they have these i don't know if i'd really call them competitions i guess maybe like incubators um they have like y combinator and stardex and some of these other ones where you sort of enter a competition and you pitch an idea, you know, with varying degrees of, uh, of, of completion. And then they choose, you know, some winners and those winners, um, you know, get connected with venture capitalists. But your goal is to get connected to a VC or a venture capitalist. Um, what they will do is they will give you some money, like maybe $5 million or $10 million, but they don't give it to you. They give it to the company. And then, as part of giving the company this money, they also sort of set up the company and they set up all the, you know, infrastructure you need to run a company. So, so you and the venture capitalists together figure out, for example, how much you should get paid. So like however much you should get paid, that's money that isn't going into the company. And so you know, also like how much of the company you own. It's like if you want a really big salary, then the venture capitalist is going to say, okay, but now you're only going to own 10% of your company instead of owning like, you know, 50% of your company. So it's sort of like how much do you want to risk and things like that. Um, Once you've sort of set all that up, then now you have this money, you can use the money and your prototype to try to get, you know, some of your friends or, or, or other people in the Valley to join your company and, and you can pay them. And it's the same deal for them. Like you can give them money and you can give them, you know, a piece of the company and they can sort of decide how much of either they want to take. And then uh, you're off, you're up and running and you're a startup. Um, Then you go through some rounds. Um, So the deal is, you know, eventually you'll burn through your, say, $5 million. Like you'll spend it all. And then you'll say, okay, well, we have a good company, but, you know, we're not making enough money to cover our expenses yet. Um, so then you go back to these venture capitalists and you say, look, I took your $5 million and I built up this company and the company last year made, let's say, uh, half a million dollars. So 
what I do need now is I need $10 million so that I can like continue to expand the company. And this, this and this and this and this reason is why, you know, I'm going to turn a profit and all that stuff. And so then they give you some more money to build a bigger company. And, uh, you know, at some point you become very big and you become sustainable. So for example, like look at, uh, Uber, for example. So Uber is still a startup technically because, you know, they haven't IPO would, um, or anything like that. Um, but Uber is, is, as far as I know, is actually, I don't know for a fact, but I believe no, Uber they just is closed profitable. a new round. No, I, the, oh, they closed I a think, new round. I think it's one of so those, okay, so this, is, this is careful, right? So like, mm -hmm. there's always a trade off between how fast you grow and, you know, funding your growth from your profits. So I, I believe I'm correct in saying that I think Uber has continued to raise more uh, investment capital uh, to be able to expand even faster, to have a first mover advantage. So basically they're trying to get oh, to as oh, many stories as possible, as many cities as possible. And so they could slow down with the cities they are and be essentially profitable, but it costs a lot of money for them to roll out in a new city. And so they'd rather keep bringing on new cities rather than getting profitable. And they're like one of the most well-funded startups in history. So like they have been given, like their investors agree with them basically. And, gotcha. and yep. that's what they've chosen to do. So yeah, what Patrick is saying, like another part of that is, you know, and Groupon has this as well is, is um, or had this, is uh, it's very hard to sort of, I mean, you hear a lot about patent trolls and patent lawsuits and things like that. But in general, if you have a business idea, it's pretty easy to copy. A and it's also very hard to shut down clones, especially clones in other countries and things like that. So a company like Uber, they have a good idea. They need to get their idea in as many cities as possible so that there isn't like a Detroit version of Uber, you know, run by a different company, a Houston version of Uber, so on and so forth. So, so that they can own all of the cities, right? And so to Patrick's point, like it might be more important to own all of the cities so there's only one Uber, uh, even if it's like going to take a ton of money and then they can make that money up later. Um, so... Yeah, so that part is pretty complicated. At some point, your startup becomes um, pretty big. And then, actually, let me step back a bit. So there's there's multiple ways for your startup to not become a startup. Uh, the most common is it dissolves. Um, so I think it's like ninety over ninety percent of startups fail. Uh, and the number one reason they fail is actually infighting. So so the people who work at the startup, you know. Clearly, the people who work at the startup believe in the startup to varying degrees and are invested in the startup to varying degrees. You know, some of them are getting a bigger salary, but are getting less, you know, portion of the company as a result. And so that creates a lot of tension. And so actually, the number one reason why startups fail is that the people, you know, there's there's social problems and the startup falls apart. Um, of the startups that succeed, there's two major categories. Um, one is, and this is for more of like startups that are more technology and less of like a product, um, is that the startup gets acquired by a bigger company. So let's say, you know, I make a startup where I do statistics for people, where I built like some cool statistics system. Um, that isn't really a company. Like I couldn't go to Patrick and sell him statistics. Like it's really like a business service. Well, and no, so, so, so it is a company and you can make money, but Jason's talking a lot about venture capital and it's hard for them. They want to recoup a lot of money quickly. And so right, they're right. taking a lot of bets and they don't want to bet on someone who says over the next 10 years, I'm going to make a million dollars each year, but not grow. I'm just going to keep making a million dollars. Like I don't have a business plan. I don't want to make a billion dollars. I just want to keep making a million dollars every year forever. Yeah, that's true. That's true. They're not yeah. really interested in, in gaining just a percentage of profits each year. They want you to have an exit. They want you to, as Jason's saying, sell out to another company or he'll talk about the other option. Right, right. Like most of the time, I mean, there are exceptions, obviously, but most of the time, if a, if a, if a company um, gets acquired, it's because it has some kind of service. Um, and, you know, usually if, if a company IPOs, it's usually like a product. You know, it could be like a product that serves businesses, but sort of a very well-defined product. But if it's like a service, 
like we do machine learning services to other companies that that usually turns into an acquisition so let me explain both of them so an acquisition just means you know a bigger company says hey look here's the startup it has like you know say eight people they're all really talented and they all work together and they're not fighting they haven't destroyed each other so you know it'd be great if we could get eight people who are all very talented to work at our big company like it'd be awesome we could just put them in a team together and we know there's not going to be any problems so they'll say you know let's buy the startup and so they might make a pretty big investment like they might spend like say 20 or even 100 million dollars and they buy the startup but what they're really buying is they're buying those people like they know that some of the people on that startup will stay at the big company some of them will leave because you know you can't force someone to work for you but you know some of them will stay and uh you know they have a very cohesive team and they'll usually work something in writing where everyone has to stay for at least a couple of years and things like that um that's an aqua acquisition um another way the startup can not be a startup is through what's called an IPO and that's where a startup becomes a publicly traded company so do you want to explain this you'll probably be better than me sure IPO is an initial public offering and that basically says that you're going to divide up the company into certain percentage shares and you're going to offer those to the public and there's all sorts of rules about uh, how you can do this and if you look at an example like Facebook is kind of the most recent famous one um, but Tesla as well. So um, these are often traded to a small number of people uh, initially on what's called a secondary market, a closed market, um, where you have to meet certain criteria in order to be able to trade. In other words, not everyone can buy Facebook shares. Uh, you have to be an investor, basically. Then right. um, they decide to IPO, which means that there's no company they either just want to or there's no company big enough to buy them or no company that's interested in, in paying what, on their terms. Uh, whatever the reason may be, they decide that they were just going to sell some portion of the percentage to the public. Um, and so they do what's called initial public offering. And you work through an investment bank to handle all sorts of complication and going to various retirement funds and getting them to agree to buy portions of Facebook and uh, you know all this stuff. But basically what's going to happen is that uh, it'll be regulated, it'll be known, you're going to declare... Uh, here's all my earnings now because before you kept them private and you agree to all this stuff and say, now the public can buy and sell, you know, a share of Facebook. Um, and for all those, say you sell, I'm going to sell 20% of the company in, you know, 20 shares. So basically each share is 1% of the company and, and Facebook keeps 80 of them and sells 20 of them to the public. Uh, and they raise money by the people buying them at whatever the initial offer price is. Right, exactly. So, and then after, from then on, when it's traded, like if you go into your brokerage account and you buy Facebook right now, Facebook doesn't get any money from that, unless so, you happen to be unless it happens to be that uh, a person at Facebook is selling you that share. But most likely, you know, like Jason could sell me that share of Facebook. Uh, it's not coming from that company anymore, so they don't continue to make money off of those shares. Right. So what happens if like if you buy all the shares and you just own the company? Like how no, does because that they work? don't offer the whole company. So oh, like I see, I in the see. case of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg now has the equivalent uh, since after the initial public offering he owns. We could look it up because it has to be public. But like let's say he still owns thirty percent of the shares, um, but then his shares may be special shares where he gets like two times the number of votes. So he may get like. You know, essentially oh, whatever that would be works out to be. But he would get, yeah, right. you know, more votes for his 30% of the shares uh, than, than the rest of people or some combination of people basically hold. So in the simplest case where you don't do vote multiplying, it's that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, whoever his other co-founders are own 51% of the shares and they only ever release 49% to be sold. Gotcha. Gotcha. So... That, that's how they maintain ownership. And then there's all sorts of clever ways to kind of keep ownership without having to own all the stock. Keep control, I should say. Gotcha. That makes sense. So, yeah. So, um, that's how that So, works. yeah. So, that's startups in a nutshell. I mean, it's, 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 it's known for being a lot of work um, for very little pay. Um, but, you know, you're looking at the total expected value. So, so you know, you're hoping that 
you know, if, you, if there's some kind of acquisition or something like that, that you can, like what they call cash out. So you might work for, you know, one fourth of what you could make um, as a regular employee at another company, but you also own, you know, let's say 1% of the company. And so then if the company becomes as big as Facebook, now you own, you know, 1% of 40 billion, which is, which is what, 400, 400 million. million which is a lot of money. Um, so you're taking a chance, you know, you're sacrificing like your pay for a chance to to uh, do really well. And I mean, statistically speaking, you, you won't do as well as like a Facebook or Google, which is like highly unlikely. But um, but uh, again, like if, if, if it's something you really believe will be successful and it will be like a, a choir or something like that, uh, uh, acquisition or something like that, then... Uh, um, then you know you could do really well. I mean, if you knew for sure that you would get acquired <laughs> or IPO, if that was a guarantee, that then you, then you would work there. Like like we would all be working at startups. No if we no, could no, get no, a no no. If it was a guarantee, guarantee. your yeah the the enti- the incentives would be structured differently, and you wouldn't get the same payout. You're absolutely right. So, so uh, what I'm saying is like uh, yeah, if if there was a guarantee that it could IPO, and you were getting like like one or two percent of the company or something like that then everyone would do it but yeah then to patrick's point like once a company is like uber where everyone knows it's going to be successful then they know that there isn't a risk and so then there's no reason you, you know, get it's, it's, you get directly less percentage of the company at that point right like but so it can still be goes, really profitable because a lot of times they still really need people and so yeah they're willing to it's it is easier for them to give stock than dollars right right so you still can like i have no idea but i assume now you can probably still get a pretty good deal going to uber uh and getting stock because they're more easily payable to you in stock than than them but then you're having to hope that by the time you can actually sell that stock that it'll be worth more than what it is now which is essentially nothing because you can't sell it (laughs) yeah right yeah that's another thing that's actually good to talk about is is uh it's very hard to know the value of a non public company and and we've seen this right like with Facebook, you know when Facebook had the i p o they i p o would it and i'm gonna get this wrong, but I mean it was roughly like thirty or forty dollars a share, which means you take say thirty dollars and you multiply by the number of shares, and that's how much you know, they think that Facebook as a company is worth. But then like within a month, they ended up at, I think it was like $12 a share. So what that means is that the public thought Facebook was worth one third of what Facebook thought they were worth. And I mean, it's more complicated than that, but but in a nutshell, what that means is, you know, the people who were at Facebook before they went public thought they were getting a certain amount of like they thought that they were worth something like their shares and everything and then within a month of the IPO they 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 found out that the shares are actually worth a third of what everyone thought they were worth and so uh, there's a lot of uncertainty but um you know because of that risk um you know startups will give you more uh shares and things like that because they know you're taking on a risk that other people aren't willing to take so yep. all right i think it's time to move on yeah. to the news Okay, so uh, So I got the first one. This came from a reader, Bents, and he sent us this. This is it's kind of interesting. If you uh, have a GitHub account and someone uh, makes a pull request against your repo repository, I'm probably getting the exact (laughs) wording wrong because I use too many (laughs) different tools. Um, But that basically, when that email comes in now in Gmail, it'll actually give you a little button on the side of the subject line that allows you to directly go and view it. Uh, so oh, essentially, cool. there's now integration between Gmail and GitHub uh, for viewing uh, updates and stuff that that come in. That's awesome. Is that like? Uh, did they have to work with the Gmail team, or is there like an API or something? Uh, I was actually just wondering that, and I clicked it. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, they're probably. I think it's the. I think the. It's like a way for the, uh, like GitHub embed something in their email basically that tells uh, tells like hey there's this thing uh gmail this is how you render it or whatever gotcha um 
That makes sense. But because Gmail is so big, I guess it's worth it. And so many GitHub users use Gmail. But, like, you would probably have to do something different. Like, there's no standard, I don't think. So, like, they wouldn't now also get something in Yahoo. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So. Um, cool. So, yeah, my news is on Rust. So, actually, I uh, we should cover this. Uh, this is a brand new... Well, sorry. It's a, it's a brand new language to me. <laughs> um, but uh, I read about it um, when I saw this news article... Uh, so th the news article is Rust 0 0.12.0 is released. Um, and so I was looking into Rust, and you know, I'm not going to say too much because we should dedicate a show to it. But uh, basically, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a language that's intended to be very fast for like system software-y stuff, you know, like C or C++. But the compiler is like very, very smart. Um, and they've reduced sort of what you can do a little bit, although it's 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 almost as fully functional as fully featured as you know C or C plus plus. They just they just handicap you a tiny bit, but in exchange, the compiler is actually extremely clever, and uh, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to do more research into it, and we'll we'll have a whole show dedicated to it. But uh, but yeah, you know, take some time and check it out uh, if you're into doing low level you know C C plus plus tasks. Um, this could be uh, really cool. So, and it compiles to like machine code and all of that. So, if that's important, you know. So, the next one is about uh, Intel processors underestimating the error bounds of uh, sign. Uh, I think it might just be trigonometric functions in general by 1.3 quintillion. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of sensationalism. But yeah. yeah. So what this is, um, there will be a link, uh, or you may have already seen, or you, or you can be able to search for it. But um, so interestingly, you design a processor out of silicone, silicon, and mm -hmm. um, they, you know, it's kind of there forever. It's just stuck with whatever is there. And and Intel has some had some famous kind of problems and what happens when things go wrong or what inputs. Uh, and this one's a little more subtle, and it's apparently been around for several years. And the documentation around the various functions are uh, incorrect. And one of it is that, uh, I believe it's actually in the processor as far as I could tell when I was reading it. Now, now that I'm thinking, I'm like, hmm, I wonder, because Intel actually also makes a compiler um, for their processors. So mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope I'm right in saying this is actually the processor, because I read no, it with an processor. assumption. Okay, good. You're right, you're right. Because I read it with an assumption, and now I was like, oh no, maybe I, okay, anyways. Uh, and so basically, the interesting part of this is that when you do a sign of a number, um, that number could be uh, pretty much, you know, the input could be anything. So in, in double or flow or whatever, the, the range of inputs is as big as you can support in doubles. And uh, obviously, you really only want to define sign as a function of just like the first repeating interval. Um, or some repeating interval. So you want to take whatever the input is and essentially wrap it around because sine is periodic, right? So sine mm -hmm. keeps repeating itself. So you want to reduce the input to something that's in a very specific range and then give a really precise answer in that range. Um, also, you have to, you're forced trying to represent, you know, the infinite part of sine out and it gets really complicated. And this is actually a really common technique for a lot of things where you have a number that doesn't overflow or have a limit but actually just keeps wrapping around and defining that wraparound function. And it turns out that there was a problem when you give a number that is very close to sine, or to pi, very close right. to pi in the input. And they had not as many bits of precision as they thought they had. And so what it causes like a whole, like the, the output basically is far less precise than it should have been. And it's actually That's in right. the silicon because of the way they're reducing that input, the way they're trying to wrap it around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you end up with what's called catastrophic cancellation, which is an awesome name. Uh, but basically, it just means um, if you try to subtract two numbers that... Um, so, in other words, so, so just a quick recap on floating point, right? The way floating point works is um, a little more complicated than this, but let's just simplify it. Imagine if you had, say, a number like, uh, you know... Uh, point one two three four five right so you could just represent that in floating point by saying one two three four five times ten to the negative you know sixth or whatever it is right so that's sort of what they do so they ha they end up with like a regular number 
and then they store an exponent. Now, in their case, they do times 2 to the whatever, but, but uh, let's just pretend it's 10 to make life easy. So if you have like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then another number that's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, then when you subtract those two, all of those first numbers are going to go to 0, and the difference is going to be 1, right? So that's going to cause like your exponent to change a lot too, right? Like you can think of in, in your head, like think you have these two big numbers, but now you subtracted them and you end up with this little number. And so actually the little number, you kind of have a lot of room to the right. Like if there were other numbers, like it was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, dot, like point seven eight nine ten eleven or seven eight nine 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 nine. Um, you know, those things after the dot become important. Like before it was, they were small because you had this huge number and then dot and then this tiny piece onto it, right? But as soon as you subtract two huge numbers, then the tiny pieces after the dot, all of a sudden they're important. But if you got rid of them because the number was big and they weren't important, so you, so you chopped them off, it's like you chopped off something that wasn't important, but then it became important later. And that's called catastrophic cancellation. And so, and that's really bad, right? Um, and so that's exactly what happens when you take a sign of a number close to pi, so. Yeah. And so the reason you get such a large thing is because when you're dealing with 64-bit numbers, uh, it's very easy to quickly escalate things to the point where you have uh, this quintillion counts of error or whatever. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, Math, cool. it's hard. Especially floating <laughs> point stuff. Yeah, floating point stuff is just a total nightmare. It's just um, tricky. There's a lot of corner cases. It's really hard to test very well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's like deceptively simple. Like you think it's an easy idea. Like, okay, we'll just take the first few digits and then we'll put 10 to the whatever. Like we've been doing scientific notation since we were in, you know, sixth grade or whatever. So you think it's going to be easy, but then the problem is computers are like doing so much math on the same number that uh, even if you make like just a tiny little approximation, it can burn you. That's what happens well, here. And, and like you point out, there's all sorts of cases like where like in actual math, the order of operations doesn't matter, but in floating point math, it does matter. So like if you yeah. multiply a very large number by a very large number by a very tiny number, like the order, the associative rule of how you actually do that will change your answer. Yep. Yep. And you have to be aware of that. Yep. And even people who are trying to do it really well still end up doing it wrong sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, cool. So, uh, yes, yeah, so this other news, it's, uh, this is only for students, unfortunately, but, uh, if you are a student at high school, university, I think any, any institution is fine. Um, then you can get the GitHub student developer pack which looks pretty freaking amazing. Um, it is just a huge laundry list of things that you get for free. Um, so yeah, you get like crowdsourcing from Cl Crowdflower. Uh, you know, you get, a, you get a pro GitHub account. Um, you get the Unreal Engine. Um, you get SendGrid to like programmatically send emails. Um, you just get a ton of amazing stuff for completely free. Uh, for no cost, as long as you can prove you're a student. Um, pretty freaking awesome. If you are a student and you're listening to us, you're high school, college, whatever, um, get this. Sign up for this. Um, it is incredible. So, um, Oh, another thing, a little bit of a side note, but uh, Amazon has something similar. Um, and get that one too. Uh, you get like free, you know, computers, like free, free uh, virtual free machines on Amazon. Yeah, AWS, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so check that out. Cool. All right. All it's right. time for book of the show. Book of the show. So my book is uh, called Impro for Storytellers. It's pretty cool. It's this guy. He's a famous, or I guess uh, not famous, but uh, he's a very experienced uh, improv improvisational uh, instructor, and so. He does a lot of like uh, corporate events and things like that. He also, you know, teaches, uh, you know, people who have gone on to work at Saturday Night Live or write for Saturday Night Live or things like that. Um, 
And he wrote this book, and he kind of intended it for everyone. He has a similar book that's kind of meant for people who want to get into improvisational comedy, which is, for me, not that interesting. But but uh, this book is really cool. It's kind of meant for anyone. And it just talks about sort of how to be impro improvisational and how to think creatively and um, how to sort of think on your feet. And um, it seems pretty cool. I mean, I've, I haven't got into it yet. I've only ordered it. So, um, oh, you know, just like a preview. A, yeah, I'll have to give a recap. But, uh, you know, I, I read through uh, some of the preview of it and it's, uh, it looks pretty awesome. And so, yeah. Cool. Mine is, of course, not helpful. It is just a science fiction <laughs> book, The Android's Dream, which uh, is by John Scalzi, a reference also to the Philip K. Dick. Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I initially thought there was oh. something weird going on there, but it is, I think it's just an homage to the other work. Uh, and they make reference of it in the book. Uh, and so, um, but it's not in, at all related as far as like the storylines. Uh, and oh, this okay. is the first book by John Scalzi. I think I've read, I may have read one other book by him, um, but he writes self described by him as, you know, introductory science fiction. So this is. Um, much closer to just normal fiction, but with science-y settings. So I, I often recommend books which are considered more hardcore science fiction, um, like very deep, you know, all sorts of uh, pseudo science -y explanations for things and even <laughs> real science or physics involved. Like this is really plausible. This is more of just of a fun tale. Um, I, I don't want to talk too much about it because I, I never want to spoil anything. Um, but basically, this is just more of a fun tale. It's in a sort of a science fiction setting. Um, and it was a pretty, it was a, it was a very, I guess, light read, but it was very good. I enjoyed it. Cool. 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 So if, if you've tried to get through some of the other very large tomes that I've recommended and you haven't, uh, try this one instead. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. I'll give it a shot. Tool of the show. Tool of the show. My tool of the show is what I'm using to stream to Twitch right now, which is called open broadcaster software. Um, so Twitch actually recommended it. You know, I went to Twitch trying to figure out how to stream, um, uh, just to stream the show, just kind of for kicks. And uh, they said, hey, use this program. And oh, so do we have I, any, uh, viewer, uh, any viewers of our stream? We have one person. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hello, person. So Callan444, uh, major props to you for checking out the Twitch stream. You know, I only gave people an hour's notice, so... Um, so you know, I wasn't expecting you know a huge turnout or anything like that. But the thing that I really think is cool about Twitch is the is the chat actually. So you know people who are you know actually I was inspired to stream this because of our user Twitch question. Twitch plays Pokemon. Oh, oh god. That. No, so a user question is the person said sort of what's it like to be in Silicon Valley it made me think we really should try to get you know a bit of a community going where where people who like the show and listen to the show can meet each other. Um, literally zero and, people and uh, we have <laughs> we have one person so Callan 444 props to you uh, sorry you couldn't meet anyone <laughs> <laughs> but you can meet us uh, for what it's worth um, and uh, yeah I mean we'll do this maybe you know a couple more shows and uh, uh, see, see sort of what kind of turnout we get but uh, but yeah so I'm using this open broadcaster software and uh, um, it's pretty cool. It's actually pretty straightforward to set up. I didn't really... Um, it, the only trouble it gave me was um, I made some changes to the settings and I had to shut it, shut down the program and restart it for the, set it to, for the changes to take effect. But I didn't know that, that I... you know, it w it, They didn't tell me to restart the program. So just a minor nit. Um, but, you know, it. Uh, other than that, it pretty much worked out of the box. And, uh, uh, yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool tool. Um, nice. Also, they have a version for Mac, and a version for Linux is coming. So, yeah. Cool. M mine is also video-related, sort of, and that is Plex, uh, which is at Plex.tv, or I think you can just search Plex. Um, and this is a combination of things, uh, which is, I guess, somewhat controversial, but I enjoy it, which is a server that you run on, I think they have Windows and Linux at least. I run both the Windows and the Linux ones, servers, and um, a client uh, has a web interface, or also it has uh, Android apps, iOS apps, 
uh, I, whatever you want. It works on, I have a Chromecast and that's how I use it a lot. It works on the Chromecast. And what it does, it will serve you all of your media. I think it does audio, pictures, uh, videos. You kind of uh, run the server, you point it at where your media is stored. Uh, and if it's, for instance, music, it'll be able to access IMDB, properly populate it, give you all the kind of what we come to expect ability to, to kind of search the moment. Uh, at least I think that works well. And then uh, if you have like, your tablet or your phone and you have the app, you know, it's able to stream from your network and, and stream it across. And you say, well, there's like a thousand ways to done this. I've talked about various ways before, UPnP ways, DLNA ways. Um, and Plex, I think actually does support uh, any DLNA client or maybe even UPnP client, I don't know. Um, but the one nice thing it does is it does, will handle the transcoding. And it's the first one I found that actually just works. So it, ah. it is mostly free. Um, they there are some features like casting to a Chromecast. They actually you have to pay to get that feature, um, and I kind of feel bad. Wait, how does that work? Like, where do they? How do they make you pay? Like so, through the app? so if you have in the app that actually does the casting, and there's probably ways around it, but I I didn't bother with it because I wanted to support them uh, because it actually works. Uh, and you, when you it won't if you haven't. Uh, signed in with a essentially a paid account it won't give you the option to cast either or if you try to cast i think it tells you like oh you need to upgrade or whatever how much is it a monthly fee or yeah so i actually just uh this is kind of i bought like the lifetime subscription i've never had tivo and we don't have cable so i guess this is like my one of my cable replacement expenses um, yeah, right. So I think it's like it might have recently gone up. I saw emails about that, but uh, I think I paid like seventy five dollars once. Wow, um, that's great. But it's kind of pricey, like seventy five dollars, and there are oh, open it went source up to alternatives. Oh, okay, that's actually a lot. Dang. More. Um, <laughs> but but like I said, it just works. Uh, there's probably other ways of doing it, and I like looked online um, and you know tried to find a non paying way of doing it, like every good software engineer person. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Not no, I don't mean like I tried to steal it, but I just mean like I tried to. Like look at open source ones, you know, right, just like course. native Linux ones, and there were, but you know, they don't really work on Chromecast. They don't really handle like transcoding on the fly. They're picky about you know what media you can use, whatever. This one just works, and it works really well for me. Um, and Good. this gets into one of those. Uh, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I can't advise you. You probably shouldn't follow. But I have a friend who uh, you know <laughs> has kids and wanted to be able to stop having to go pull out like dvds of cartoons to stick on for them and it turns out if you kind of record those dvds on your computer and if there's a legal way to do that and you did that and you use this to serve them up to your tv it makes it great because uh it would make it great because you could then not have to go get the dvds and stick them in for your children when they wanted something you could actually just show them the pictures of all the covers and and have them choose which one they wanted to watch yeah this is awesome i'm definitely gonna have to try this out do they have like a free Wait, what does the premium get you again? So I think that's just if you only if you want to so you can install the server, see that it's correctly picking up your stuff and streaming it over the web interface. Um, and then it's just if you want to Chromecast it, I think is the only thing I use it oh, for. Oh, I see, I see. It also offers you the ability to like do remote syncing. So like uh, now that I have the subscription, I can <clears throat> my phone can upload my pictures to my server as backup like automatically. Uh, and some other features like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool. That's awesome. So, yeah, I'm anyways. actually going to install this tonight. All right. Yeah, well, let me know. Like, I've, I've recommended even other ones similar to this on the show, but this is the first one that I've stuck with because it actually seems to work really well. Yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, I have a Linux box that's plugged in the TV um, that's running Ubuntu that I'll definitely install this on. All right, yeah. Um, oh, a little bit of a tangent. I installed FreeBSD on a virtual, like, virtual box, um, like, virtual machine just to see because, you know, if... It keeps coming up like this Plex, you know, they have a binary for free BSD and uh, um, and it came up, you know, work and things like that. And so I was like, look, let me just look at this. And because I never quite understood um, what free BSD really was. Mm -hmm. And again, like I, I played with it for maybe, you know, an hour. So I still don't don't really know. You know, I, I think it's like uh, the big difference between it and Linux is the license. So in other words, you can use FreeBSD commercially and, and it's okay. You know, like you could even modify the source code and, and not contribute back or I don't know. But uh, so, so there's sort of like political reasons why you'd want to use FreeBSD. But uh, it seems like just uh, not as good as Linux. <laughs> like it could be just because I'm used to using Linux. 
But like, for example, the first thing I did was I tried to, you know, sudo a command so that I didn't have to be root. And sudo like doesn't exist in free There's some other methodology for doing it, yeah. Yeah, either that or or you have to log in. So and, like, I used to be into like Linux in distributions and stuff, and I gave up, and now I'm just on Ubuntu. I'm uh, the same way. And it's just because, it, it, like, it, there's literally only one reason. It isn't philosophical, political, nothing. Is because when I have a problem, and I write in Ubuntu, and then my problem, I'm most likely to get my answer than any other distribution. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's totally true. Like it sounds horrible and I like it's just enough people use it now that like I can typically find an answer to my problem. Yep. I don't have to post my own thing, I don't have to like hack on it for an hour. Um, if there's some like, oh, you know, like you were talking earlier about open broadcaster software is gonna have a Linux, I know they'll most likely have a Debian or Ubuntu version, uh, right. because it's so popular and I can just install it and it's almost guaranteed to work. I remember like when Ubuntu first came out and uh, like right off the bat, it was just so superior to all the other distributions in terms of its user friendliness. And I remember like immediately saying, like I was using, I think Gen 2 and Ubuntu came out and I was like, okay, I'm done. Like they, I immediately converted um, and you know, they just keep getting better and better. And you know, Ubuntu is, uh, um, has a huge like, uh, um, like investor it's actually made in, I think, South Africa, or it's at least a South African investor who owns the Ubuntu company. And uh, so it's just very well funded. And I think that's the reason why it's so, so polished. Um, but anyways, it's a little digression. There. All right, we're on to so, funky languages. Funky languages. So everyone get out your, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, bell bottoms, and your, you know, Afro wigs and uh, your We're disco lights. going back lights. to the 70s. Going back disco. to the 70s. So, uh, uh, so, yeah, so one of them, we'll just kind of go through them and, 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 uh, and talk about them briefly. So uh, my favorite is, uh, one of my favorites is white space. And as exactly how it sounds, it's all tabs. Oh, first of all, props to whoever suggested this. I, I don't remember who it is, but somebody wrote in and you told us You know who you do. are. Yeah. So, uh, so props to you. I'll, I'll see if I, if, if there's a little break, I can look you up, but, uh, this is a great idea for, for a show. Um, so white space is all tabs, spaces, and new lines. So, so literally that is the language. Um, so, you know, like one tab means something, two consecutive tabs means something else, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, obviously you'll have to use an editor which can tell you where a tab is versus four spaces. <laughs> so you have to have one that <laughs> sort of highlights the tabs. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, all, all of these languages are fully functional. Like you could write anything to them. They're Turing them, complete, but they're not necessarily anyone would ever attempt to write actual programs in them. Any, yeah, for anything right. other than fun. Like we don't think these are productive for efficient uses of your time in any way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, don't bring these up in an interview. <laughs> oh, well, so so this white space one, I literally had a conversation today at work where uh, at, at the job I work at, when we do interviews, we do them on whiteboards or chalkboards, but, but mostly whiteboards. And I, I said that I'm going to scare the next interview candidate by saying we're going to do coding in white space on the whiteboard. <laughs> you could have a, like, sort of like a fight club moment. Like at the end of Fight Club, the guy says, you know, he realizes he's. Well, Wait, are you spoiler? Spoil don't it. spoil. <laughs> um, but 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 uh, that could totally backfire because you could say we have to write it in white space, and then the person could say, "I've just wrote I every program possible." Or, or like I already did. There's the perfect answer. It's on the board. <laughs> anyway, that was, that was oh, just man. a joke, but yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So so white space. Uh, one kind of funny thing about it, another funny thing about it is um, um, it, it ignores any real characters. And so languages like, you know, Java and C++ ignore white space. So, um, so you can actually write a C++ program that has a white space program embedded inside of it. And like, if you compiled it with the white space compiler, you'd get one program that worked. And if you compiled it with the C++ compiler, you'd get a different program that also worked, but uh, you know, potentially did something different. They could also do the same. 
Actually, that would be pretty cool if they have a white space. It's like they do. Both programs do identical things. Yeah, if they have a C plus plus to white space transpiler, but but one that respected the fact that like there's some spaces that have to be there. Oh, you know, that like, sounds like, complicated. Like Not doing this in Python. Oh yeah, Python this wouldn't work. But it'd be pretty cool to write a program which took your C plus plus program and figured out and transpiled it to white space and then put the white space in the program. But anyways, <laughs> it's crazy talk. Um. Okay. So that's white space. Uh, I'll be back with the next one. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have very many Arnold Schwarzenegger quotes. But th the next one is Arnold C. And uh, most of the keywords and function calls are replaced with Arnold Schwarzenegger movie quotes. I actually don't know where some of these are from. Uh, and I probably will not do any more impersonation voices. I need to read, <laughs> read Jason's acting book that he recommended. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. So it's showtime. Talk to the hand with... Hello, world. And you have been terminated. That's, that's not Arnold voices. <laughs> that was terrible. All right, you want to try, Jason? Um, yeah, I mean, so no, the hello, world. It. Okay, go ahead. Oh, wait, what's that? Go ahead. Yeah, do it in, in the right Yeah, accent. the hello, world goes, uh, it's showtime. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's like, uh, how does he go? Like, talk through the hand. <laughs> nope. I work with some guy who's Austrian. He's Austrian, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger? Um, I actually work with a guy who's Austrian, and he does sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Which is do, do you remarkable. tell him that? Because I'm sure no one's ever told him that. Uh, I'm sure everyone, yeah, everyone tells him that. Um, yeah. So and so when when the Arnold C program exits, instead of just you know exit with parentheses, it goes, "You have been terminated." <laughs> Yeah, so um, this one's only awesome if you say all of them in the Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation. Yeah, that's right. So uh, real quick, the guy who had the idea was Ryan. Um, so props to you, Ryan. He didn't give us a last name or where he's from or anything. But uh, but props to you. This is a great idea for a show, Ryan. Thanks. Okay. So next one um, is involving more of your senses. So That's instead right. of just your eyes, you should also involve your ears and hear the music of your code. That's right. So the next one is Valato, Valato. But yes. uh, it's a, so the input to the compiler is a MIDI file. So in other words, you know, you, you, you play a song on your keyboard, you give that song to the Valato compiler and out comes a computer program. <laughs> so it's pretty wild. Um, you could actually hear your source code. Um, before you build it. So this one was actually interesting because when I was reading up about it, um, it's actually, you need to know a f some music theory to, to even understand what it's saying. So for instance, to, uh, to have an, assi a you know, an assignment, a variable assignment, then you have to play your second note as a minor third over the first note. You don't need a third note. And then the variable is a single note, then the expression. <laughs> I, I don't even know what that means I have no idea what you just <laughs> an if statement is a third note being the perfect fifth okay I, wait, I don't, do they have a like transpiler like can I can I take you know uh, like some code at work and turn it into Valedo and then play it I don't I don't know that'd be cool and then just like listen to what your existing one sounds like yeah, yeah, yeah. Be like, wow, this is what you know. This library sounds and like. And it has. <laughs> it even has allowances. So the command note, which is your root note, and these other intervals are on top of those to you know say basically if or whatever, can uh, kind of move around to allow for less repetitive note. Like actually make it sound musical. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah. So this one's interesting. interesting. It's just beautiful to look at the program because it just looks yeah. like crazy, like that, that music that I can never play. Cause it's not just one note at a time. And, uh, they really should have a thing in Wikipedia. I mean, not Wikipedia, Wikipedia has this, but they should have a thing on this particular page where you could hear the program. Uh, yeah. You know? uh, like, yeah. Wikipedia will pronounce something. Oh, actually they have it. It's right here. Okay. Hang on. I'm going to play, play it. it. Oops. Hang on. Let me go We're going to get a I'm DMCA play... takedown. Here's Hello World. Okay. It actually, there's like two thirds of it left. But yeah, that's, that's Hello okay, World. Okay, I heard nothing. I was going to say it sounds a lot like my programs, just empty. 
<laughs> Wait, you didn't hear anything? Nope, it's okay, though. Well, uh, hopefully we found it, or this will be... Well, I, I definitely later. played it. Hopefully the uh, Your audio the recording audience got it. it. All right, all right, cool, cool. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe... Uh, we'll, we'll check after, it later. In, Don't worry about it. In the editing, you should just you should just mux it in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, anyways. Uh, it will have been muxed in. Yeah, Ignore the, this uh, conversation. <laughs> yeah, the... Um, what was I going to say? Uh, the Wikipedia page has a link to the MP3 if you guys want to listen to it. Cool. All right. So um, the next one is Piet. Do you want to talk about Piet? So uh, our previous one was constructing musical programs. This one is uh, using your drawing artist ability to construct <laughs> programs. Uh, and this is actually, so um, Piet, I believe, is the name of, is it Mondrian? Mondrian Piet is the guy who created those uh, kind of like abstract square paintings where like there's like a red uh, a red rectangle and a blue monk rectangle. Maybe I'm completely... Uh, you're right, guessing. Piet Mondrian. Oh, I said it wrong. I think I said Mondrian Piet. Anyways, Piet Mondrian. So if you look at his pictures, there's like a classical, like I didn't know specifically, but I have seen his pictures before, like uh, prim primary colored squares with like black outlines, almost look like a stained glass window in, in, in some ways. And he's kind of famous yep. for those paintings. And so someone made a programming language which uses that same similar style to actually be the program. So it uses the colors and the pixel locations to create what the program is. Uh, and of all the pages, this one actually seems like the most filled out with like, here's the compiler and here's like the documentation and here's alternative ones. And here's some gallery of, uh, you know, collected ones. So this one seems pretty well put together. Yeah, I love it. And if you look at the, if you go to the Piet website and you look at the sample programs, they have like, hello world. Um, they have one that prints like Fibonacci numbers, uh, but then they have one. It says Towers of Hanoi. This program solves the Towers of Hanoi problem. Don't ask me how it works. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> you know, you have a good um, funky programming language when nobody knows. Even the person who owns the language website doesn't know how, how your program works. Yeah, so, uh, again, I, I have no idea that you could be at all productive in this, especially since, like, it appears that some of the colors are fairly close, like different shades of red. So, A, if you're colorblind, I don't, I, I think you're just in trouble. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, definitely. And then even if you're just, like, there's, like, different shades of purple represent different things. And maybe if you're, like, a designer and you're, like, really into various colors, like, this would work, but... So somebody wrote a Piet um, transpiler, like a Piet assembler, they're calling it. Okay. And uh, um, and so they took a video game, a text adventure game, and uh, compiled it to Piet. And it is, as you would expect, just like a gigantic. So if you're if you're watching the stream, you can actually see what I'm seeing, which is just a gigantic image. And. Uh, Supposedly, if you compiled this image with the Piet compiler, you'd get a text adventure game. Ooh, <laughs> fun. Pretty cool, yeah. But, I f you know, did you ever use, what was that, uh, oh, why is the name escaping me now? The one with the little turtles, and you can move the turtles. Oh, yeah, Logo. Logo, yes. Uh, it's kind of like, that. Like I feel like these programs should, like, be animated, like, actually do stuff when they run, like, produce, yeah, produce yeah. pictures as the output as well. Yeah, like if like the, it seems um, anticlimactic that you draw this beautiful program of music or whatever, and then the output is like an actual executable that just runs and does normal stuff. Yeah, yeah, totally. There should be like a memory visualizer or something. Be so oh, cool. there you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if the you should get on that, that Jason. With all your free time. Yeah, I'll get right on that. All, all my free time. Yeah. Oh man. Um, cool all right yeah that's so there's a ton of these funky languages many more um yeah yeah definitely check them out we covered some you know most of the major ones <laughs> the um, major ones yeah <laughs> i see what you did it that was a music reference uh, yeah <laughs> oh man um so uh uh yeah we covered most of them but uh there's there's plenty more and uh you know especially the ones that have you know the assemblers or transpilers where you can take you know, your college project and turn it into um, Valeto or Piet without any, um, you know, work on your part. That would be pretty hilarious to to submit that. You know what I mean? 
It's like I no like, no. Yeah, well, I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but no. like if you if you could somehow submit a Piet drawing instead of your homework, but then maybe like also submit your homework. <laughs> Then uh, programming interviews cool. do not do programming interviews in Vallejo and like drawing notes on the boards <laughs> and base clefts and no don't do that. Yeah, could you imagine if someone said, uh, "Yeah, I only write in Piet, and I'm gonna need a marker of each type <laughs> of each color." <laughs> oh no, no. Okay, <laughs> this is devolving quickly. All right. Well, oh if we missed gosh. your favorite uh, funky language, you can write us and let us know. Uh, Maybe we'll have to do Funky Languages Part 2. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Um, Thank you guys for your so. continued comments of uh, that we're doing good, that you don't like something, that uh, you have questions for us. It's all really good. Recently, I, I was browsing uh, the tech category of podcasts in iTunes and noticed that of all tech podcasts, so that includes... Things like Leo Laporte's, like This Week in Tech, uh, you know, some really big major brand uh, podcasts. We were number 74, so that was pretty good. I yeah, have no idea what totally arbitrary awesome. rating they're using, but uh, we were number 74, <laughs> so I was happy to see our little icon in the list with all these other, like, hey, I know what that podcast is, and hey, like, those people are big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, thanks a lot, guys, for, for your support. I mean, you're the reason why. Uh, why uh you know we get uh we get the downloads and the and the ratings things like that so we definitely appreciate it um you know we're, we're doing we're gonna do this twitch stream for at least a couple more shows so uh feel free to jump on looks like we're up to like three people <laughs> so yeah so, okay, so uh, that's current viewers but how many like over the course have viewed our stream oh i haven't been looking uh, but uh, I was gonna probably, I was gonna make fun of us, and then I briefly went to Twitch and noticed the one on their main like their homepage that they were featuring was people sitting around a table playing uh, pen and paper Dungeons and Dragons. So I'm not <laughs> sure that we're that far off from that. So maybe this isn't such a bad idea. <laughs> oh, no man. offense to Dungeons um, and Dragons or no, all the I wonderful mean, I, people playing it. I'm sure it was. I've awesome. played pen and paper before. It's been fun. But uh, um, yeah, so so uh, you know, thanks a lot for your support. It's been awesome. Um, you know, uh, next time I'll give people more notice, um, and uh, you, know, you can jump on and talk to some of the other people who are, uh, you know, who are fans of the show. Um, what else? We uh, hopefully we answered. Oh, oh, oh! One other thing is, uh, you know, last episode I talked about rejection sampling. Um, so I briefly talked about this idea of like distributions and sampling, easy distributions you know, to get more difficult distributions. And anyways, um, you know, so, so check back on the last episode if you want to recap of that. But somebody was sort of inspired from that and then kind of did some research on Wikipedia and stuff like that and actually implemented rejection sampling. And let me actually put it in the show notes. Um, so check this link out. This guy actually implemented it in IPython Notebook. And so you can actually run it in the browser and uh, um, and see the result and stuff like that. He even has like visualizations. Well, talk about viewer feedback. Stuff. Yeah, it's pretty freaking awesome. So uh, so props to you for for doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, and it actually made me check out IPython Notebook. I like give it another look, and actually, I think it's pretty awesome. Um, definitely a big fan. So I don't think I said this last that. time, but um, I have a little bit of a confession to make. So I think okay. when uh, when I was in, what is this, probably like uh, fifth grade, sixth grade science fair, I actually essentially did this for my science fair project. <laughs> oh, really? You made like a notebook so, kind of thing? No, no. So I made a random number generator out of like electrical components that I'd found, you know, like some uh, like in Radio Shack or whatever. And you okay. would push the button and it would give you a random number. And then I collected a whole bunch of random numbers, then like uh, used, I think it was like Mathematica at the time to like plot them all, you know, with like a quarter quadrant of a circle and like determine how many were, were in or out of the circle and basically calculated pi using my random number generator as my science fair project. Wow, did you win? That sounds like an amazing project. So, uh, no. Oh. Yeah, my science fair project was was terrible. It actually, you're going to laugh. My science fair project literally was a solar-powered flashlight. Literally. Like, I, I felt like it, if you were, like, 
trying to look into an area, but the flashlight could still have. Wait, solar I didn't get power. it. So I didn't get it at first. I was like, <laughs> wait, why are you being so down on yourself? That sounds fine. And then I'm like, oh wait. <laughs> Like, it, it only worked for, like, a minute because, like, the capacitor was tiny, right? It was just it was terrible. Oh. But uh, so Sebastian uh, Rashka, I'm uh, sorry if I butchered your name, but Sebastian's the one who um, actually wrote this iPython notebook. Nice. And uh, it's very it, cool. And I wasn't so putting it down by Sebastian. saying I did that, like, as a science fair project a long time ago. I was just admitting no, no, to how I nerdy think, I was. I mean, if I was the judge, you would have won first place. No, but I think, I think the judges didn't awesome get it. Report. So I think, like, someone who did, like, do trees do better with rock music or not one? Oh yeah yeah so you like, were like a savant like no no it wasn't that you. at all it was just very like it's out there right people are like I don't get it like yeah it, you, yeah anyways it was yeah, more like, math than science I blame myself yeah you ended up like two positions below the rock music but you did better than the guy who made Facebook for the <laughs> science fair project <laughs> the judges are just that no. out of touch no <laughs> Oh, oh no. Okay. Uh, All right. I think they were like Y Combinator up. judges. <laughs> okay. Wrapping this up. Till next time. All right. Yeah, we're getting in trouble. So uh, thanks a lot for the support, you guys. Uh, the community is awesome. We love the feedback, the emails, the questions. Uh, people who take what we say and actually implement it. Um, uh, totally props to you guys. And uh, yeah, the next time we go on Twitch, we'll give you we'll give you, you know, a couple of days or a week notice, um, so we can get you know. Uh, uh, sort of more community. There's some people chatting in there, but uh, but uh, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll we'll get more people on there and you can give us some instantaneous feedback if we mess up or something like that. <laughs> All right, cool. Sounds good. All right, have a good one, guys. See you later. Yeah. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.